Well, hi, this is Custom Works, and I am Clint Allen. Today's tech talk is going to be about a fuel issue. Uh, just came through the shop, but before we get going on that, uh, special thanks to Troy A., who lives down under in Australia, who I did a Zoom call, actually three Zoom calls with. We figured out that his brand new rebuilt 7.3 engine had a faulty spring pressure setting. And I walked him through not only the diagnosis of it, but without removing the head, how to reset that without having to take the whole part of the engine apart. So special thanks to you, Troy A. $1,000 super thanks. Thank you very much for doing that. Long time watcher of the channel according to him. So going through the shop, now that I'm back in the shop, we had a truck come through, a special request from a friend, from a friend, from a friend, has a 1999 F350, 7.3 of course, and it just doesn't run right. It just doesn't have power, it's doggy, and I thought this is a, per I've been wanting to do this for quite a while, so perfect time to do this. If you are not in the know, on your fuel bowl, 1994.5 all the way up to 03 on the 7.3s, you have a fuel spring. The original fuel spring that Ford put in these engines had a failure problem. They would run at 50 to 55 PSI at idle and at full throttle, they would actually come down to 37 PSI not giving you the power that you should have on your 7.3. And a lot of people have this issue and it's so it's an easy thing to fix. And they do make a really good replacement spring and that'll be down in the description. And as long as I'm talking about down in the description, if you're new here, down in the description, not only are you gonna find a place to buy this new fuel spring, but I have all of my playlists, almost all of my playlists, down in the description, easy for you to find. A full injector series. I'm, when I talk full, we're not out in our driveway with a cell phone making videos, okay? We go right from the root of how these things are made, how they work, how to rebuild them, how to shim them, all kinds of down home information hands on camera boom showing you how to do this got our controversial videos our tech talk videos tons of videos that are high quality for you to view on your 7.3 and when i get done and you finish viewing you will have learned something so back to this fuel thing let me show you. So we take a T27. Now I, I, I leave the line on when I do this, but you can take this line off if you want. Just put a rag underneath there, obviously, to catch the diesel. And right there we got the spring. So Ford later on realized that they had an issue with that spring, the, the, the first generation spring. And then they came out with the performance spring and that spring is blue and that comes from Ford. Either which way, if you have the original one still in your truck or you upgraded to the blue one, the problem is, is that these springs, every time you have a heat cycle driving the vehicle, that heat cycle slowly reduces and deteriorates the springability, the pressure that is holding on the fuel bowl itself. Now, if you have larger injectors or a bigger tune, whatever the case may be, 
keep in mind that there's a lot of springs out in the market and a lot of people that are making a lot of promises, okay? Not all springs are created equal. Most of the springs that are out on the market hold pressure immediately and then fade off on these replacement springs. If you're a proponent of, oh, you know, I'll put a 90 PSI spring in. No, 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 no. Higher pressure is not going to equal more fuel going to those injectors. There, there is a variance going on here, a situation where high volume and you still have low flow, that there has to be an equal, okay? You can't have too low and you can't have way too high. It, it'll, it, uh, a 90 PSI spring will actually cause issues. These springs that I put in from this company, which once again is down in the description, is a really high quality spring. It'll outlast three trucks. It just does not deteriorate. Keep 75 to 85 PSI at idle and 50 to 55 PSI at full throttle. Even if you got the big, super massive injectors, the, you know, the stage three injectors, you got the big tune on there, it's gonna, it's gonna hold that pressure. Over the heat cycles, it's not gonna lose its tension. Once again, they're so high quality that you can use them over a lifetime in three trucks. Very good quality, very good way to go. So if you're running into runnability issues and you haven't done anything with your fuel spring, and then, and then we're just putting aside the fact that, yes, you can, re you can delete the bowl. I, I'm aware of that. You can put in a pressure valve. I'm fully aware of that. There's a lot of people that watch this that don't want to get into those type of mods, all right? This is the mod that you want to get into then if you're going to keep the fuel bowl. Uh, go ahead, order yourself one, real easy to put in, just, you know, 15, 20 minutes. I mean, I'm talking about going to the toolbox, opening up the hood, it's just that quick. So, this solved this gentleman's problem. I mean, we just put in the new fuel spring, it was real easy to figure out. On the back of the fuel bowl right here, we just removed this, we put a pressure gauge in, and we check it at idle, we go down the road with it, we try full throttle, and we just watch the gauge go and just die right out. At full throttle, he was getting 18 PSI and the truck was quitting out basically. So that is one of the ways that you can for sure know how much pressure is in this bowl. Go down to your automotive store, whatever the case may be, go down to Harbor Freight, buy yourself a pressure, fuel pressure gauge, hook it on up, let it sit on the windshield, take it out for a drive. That's one way to figure out if you're having a problem in your fuel tank, your uplift pump, your main pump that's sitting on top of the engine, it, either which way. That's a good way to figure that out. So as always, I hope you've learned something today and you take it easy and you have a good day and I'll be seeing you very shortly. It's 1984 Ford F-250 pickup truck. Now this is special because this is the second year for Ford's factory optional diesel V8. This is a base F-250, nothing frilly here, no Lariat, nothing like that, but you gotta love that diesel emblem right there. Seen for the very second year, right here. 83, 84, second year right there. Uh, and again, really begins Ford's diesel pickup truck dynasty. Now, no superchargers, no turbochargers. These are naturally aspirated. Uh, so again, you know, not particularly potent, but good torque. Now, the diesel V8 wasn't available in half tonners, strictly three quarters and one tonners. And we gotta remember that Chevrolet and GMC were the first out with a diesel V8 in pickup trucks in 1978. But that was the 5.7 liter 350 Oldsmobile gas engine based diesel V8, which really wasn't heavy duty. By contrast, Ford went all the way with their V8. Now again, this launched in 1983, and this is called the International IDI. 
the indirect injection. Now this engine launched with 420 cubic inches from 1983 through 87, and then grew to 444 cubic inches in 1986 through 1994. And this is the beginnings of Ford's Power Stroke Diesel Dynasty. Now, Ford did not design this engine on its own. In fact, International Harvester uh, worked with Ford on this design, and the idea was that International would make these engines. Ford vowed to buy a lot of them, which they did. Now again, the IDI indirect injection engine, uh, the fuel injectors launch right in here. Underneath this are pre-chambers that then send the fuel into the combustion chambers. These have about 22 to 1 compression. So as a result, the starter motor on these things has to be a monster and it's a 24 volt system. There are two batteries, one on this side of the engine bay and one on that side over there. So two batteries. And of course, that's not that uncommon. Cummins diesels and a lot of diesel trucks have two batteries. Again, it's all about cranking that huge 22 to 1 compression engine over. And speaking of guts inside of that, the 420 IDI is an undersquare engine, meaning that it has a smaller bore than it has stroke. Four inch bore, four and eight, four point one eight inch stroke. And generally speaking, you want to have a bigger bore than stroke, you know, the undersquare or the oversquare design. But here, the diesels, these things redline at 3200 RPM. So high RPM or high RPM operation isn't really a big deal. Uh, so again, this is kind of an unusual thing. It's an it's an oversquare uh, V8 design. But something kind of cool is the aluminum intake manifold right there. You usually think of aluminum intakes on 446 packs and, you know, Boss 429s, that kind of stuff. But here we have it here. You got to remember, too, that, uh, you know, every ounce removed from the weight of the truck is another ounce you can use to pull cargo or a trailer. So the aluminum intake made sense and probably saved a few bucks. Who knows? But of course, power brake standard equipment on the uh, F. 250. Again, this is a uh, three-quarter tonner. The size of this radiator, too, this is massive. This is about, uh, got to be 20% larger than a 460 V8 radiator. And keep in mind, too, the whole point of the diesel V8 engine was that it cost a little more, but the idea was that you'd save uh, in gasoline or fuel expenses. Uh, these things had about 6% more torque than a 400 cubic inch gas V8. In fact, this engine right here made 170 horsepower and 315 foot-pounds of torque. Remember that, 170 horsepower. Keep in mind, going back to the uh, GM 1978 up 5.7 diesel, the Oldsmobile-based thing, which was used in cars and half-ton pickup trucks and even some three-quarter tonners, those things only made 125 horsepower. So these things were almost 50 horsepower, or actually over 50 horsepower stronger than the GM uh, 5.7. Of course, GM would pick up with the Duramax engines and pretty much, uh, you know, do their own thing.